During the mid to late 19th century, a man named Jacob Schmitz, his wife and their daughter lived in Madison, Wisconsin. They were well known to the neighborhood, so when Jacob Schmitz apparently vacated the home during the summer of 1872, it didn't go unnoticed. But it wasn't until April of 1873 that the people of the neighborhood became concerned. Mrs. Schmitz refused to speak on the matter, but it couldn't be ignored that since the departure or disappearance of Jacob, the woman and her daughter appeared increasingly unkempt and malnourished. It was obvious that since her husband's absence, they had lived in relative poverty. As the months passed, rumours began to circulate, and it was even considered that the man had been murdered by his wife. The word of murder spread, and eventually two police officers arrived at the house to investigate. Mrs. Schmitz would not allow them to enter, and explained that since her husband's absence, she did not open the door to any men. When asked about Jacob's whereabouts, she told the police that he had abandoned the family, moving to California in July of 1872. She hadn't seen or heard from him since, and now supported her daughter on the charity of others. When pressed for information, Mrs. Smith told the officers that a month after her husband had left, a stranger came to the house and told her that her husband had been murdered, and that his remains could be found in a cellar in California. After delivering the message, the stranger walked away. She had no idea who he was or where he had gone. Besides, she said, she was not suffering the loss of her husband, and planned to leave Madison to remarry. The officers retired, but kept a watch on the house that day. When Mrs. Schmitz and her daughter came out of the house a few hours later, they were both arrested, taken to the police station and locked up. Now the sheriff and the two officers had free reign on the property. By now, fully expecting to find the remains of Jacob Schmitz in some dark corner of the basement, they entered the dimly lit house through the window. They hadn't been there long before a screaming figure wielding an axe lunged at them from an adjoining room. The gaunt, emaciated, hollow-eyed man, who looked as if he hadn't eaten in weeks, took a swing at one of the officers with the weapon, delivering a glancing blow to the head. The man who you will have guessed by now was Jacob Schmitz, was overpowered by the officers and taken to jail. It was reported that he had lost control of his mind during the summer of 1872. I'll end this story with the last words of a report written in 1873. There is no doubt that he went mad last summer, and that his wife, unwilling to make his misfortune public, and have him removed to an asylum, had kept him locked up all this time, feeding him as she could from the scanty donations of the charitable. Since the two have been placed in jail, Mrs. Schmidt's mind has given way, and she too is a raving maniac. As both Jacob and his wife were now locked up, and, according to the local press, had lost their minds, I wondered about the fate of their daughter, but could find no more information on the case. This next story begins on Friday, April 22nd, 2005, when there was an all-night standoff between police and 52-year-old Philip Schuth at his home on French Island, which is located in the middle of the Mississippi River in La Crosse County. Police were called to the house on Bainbridge Street after it was reported that Schuth had shot and wounded his neighbour Randy Russell following an altercation concerning the victim's 10-year-old son. The boy had told his parents that Schuth had hit him across the head for riding too close to his house. Both parents confronted Schuth and after admitting that he had hit the boy, he pulled out a handgun and opened fire. Randy Russell was hit three times, but managed to escape the scene with his family. He survived and was later treated for his wounds. When a SWAT team arrived, Schuth retreated back into his house. He warned the negotiators that he had a large amount of explosives, and it would be, quote, high noon before he surrendered. After a 15-hour long negotiation, Schuth finally gave himself up without further incident, in the early hours of Saturday, April 23rd. When police entered Shuth's premises, they found more than 15 homemade explosive devices, packed with nails, staples and other metal items. A sawn-off shotgun, along with 15 other firearms, were also recovered from the ground floor. But it was what lay in the basement that really got their attention. You see, during the all-night standoff, Shuth had made a startling confession. Once in the basement, police found a chest-type freezer. When they opened it, they could see that there was something very large encased in a block of ice. 
After chipping away at the block, they revealed a human knee. As they continued to break down the ice, they uncovered an entire, intact body of a woman in a sitting position. The body was identified as Edith Sheath, the mother of Philip, who once shared the house with him. According to her son, she passed away of natural causes back in 2000. He explained that, just before she passed away, she was attacked by her cat, and blood marks were left on a wall. He kept her death a secret, he said, because he thought police would suspect that he had murdered her. He said he had nothing to do with her death, but after police found $10,000 in cash on the premises, Shuth admitted that he had been collecting her social security checks. An autopsy later revealed that Edith Shuth had in fact died of natural causes. A week after the incident, businessman Dan Gable found a money-making opportunity in the story. He made a small batch of bumper stickers and fridge magnets with the slogans What's in your freezer? and My mum's cooler than yours. The design showed a chest freezer with a hand coming out of it. Gable said that sales had gone so well he had to make more to keep up with demand. Unsurprisingly, his new enterprise was thought to be in bad taste by many. Scathing reports on Gable appeared in newspapers across the state, and according to a phone-in poll on a local television network, a third of the callers were appalled by his actions. Meanwhile, as the story unfolded, it was soon realised that Philip Shuth had been a recluse all of his life. His friends and Shuth himself said that his mother had forced him into a life of solitude, something that he had got used to over the years, and something he wasn't willing to change. In November of 2005, he was sentenced to seven years in prison for attempted homicide, reckless endangerment, and concealment of a corpse, plus ten years extended supervision once he was released. Four months were later added to his prison term for illegally cashing social security checks. Philip Schuth struggled with the transition to the penal system far more than most. He demanded to live in solitary confinement from day one, and made efforts to ensure this happened through displays of reckless conduct, like threatening to stab prison wardens. He was transferred to various correctional facilities over the years, and due to his conduct, he succeeded in spending most of his time in solitary confinement. His attorney, Michael Lieberman, spoke on the matter. He said, He's somebody who just wants to be left alone. It appears that, in his mind, keeping himself in solitary confinement is the best way to keep himself safe. Wisconsin District Attorney Scott Horn said, He had some unique issues in his upbringing that contributed to it, which are probably treatable. We all learned to deal with minor conflicts because we were taught and brought up to do that. He wasn't. He was released from Dodge Correctional Institution in April of 2012 to live in a halfway house under extended supervision. In the years during his prison term, the house in which Shuth lived on Bainbridge Street was pulled down and the land sold. It was December 29th, 1888, when police in London got word of a fugitive on board a ship approaching Queenstown, Ireland. London was still reeling from the horrors left behind by a murderer they now call Jack the Ripper. It had been only two months since Mary Kelly, the fifth official Ripper victim, was found, and now they were soon to be faced with a Wisconsin man who was running from a crime every bit as horrific. On the evening of Friday, December 21st, 1888, Two brothers, George and William Rear, were fishing at Mount Vernon Creek, Springdale, Wisconsin, when they hooked a mysterious canvas sack. When they brought it ashore and looked inside, they saw the head of a man along with internal organs. William Rear immediately went to the nearest house to report the find. The occupant, a Mr. Furge, recognised the man as Wilhelm Christen, the proprietor of a local cheese factory. When police searched the factory in Primrose Dane County, Masses of clotted blood were found clinging to the floor and walls. Inside a fireplace were scorched bones and remnants of the dead man's clothes. In the cellar they found an axe smeared with blood and ashes, along with a pair of boots. Police were soon on the trail of one Johan Kuhn, a Swiss man, said to be around 26 years old, who had been employed at the factory, and shortly after the time of the murder, had boarded the SS Lord Gough in Philadelphia, which was destined for Liverpool via Ireland. A local witness told them that a man matching Johan's description had asked him for a lift to the train station in New Glarus, Green County. He said that during the journey, the stranger had told him where he was going, 
but asked him not to tell anyone. Word was sent to the authorities in Ireland, and on December 29th, two detectives named Foley and Helen were sent to intercept the vessel before it arrived at Roaches Point in Queenstown, which is now known as Cove. Johan Kuhn was arrested on arrival and detained until Tuesday, January 1st, when he was brought before a magistrate court in Queenstown. With the help of an interpreter, he told the court that he knew nothing of the murder and was simply en route to Switzerland. On the same day, Detective Frank Froist of Scotland Yard arrived to escort him to London, where he was charged with murder on Thursday, January 3rd. Sheriff John Estes, who was already hot on a trail of Kuhn, was sent from Washington to represent the US government in dealing with the case. Kuhn was held in London until sufficient proof was received to warrant his extradition back to America. The details of the inquest, which was held in Wisconsin on December 22nd, arrived in London on January 10th, 1889. When Johann Kuhn was brought before a judge at Bow Street Court, he said that his arrest was, quote, an unmerited disgrace, and that he was not fleeing justice, he was simply on his way to his homeland of Langenthal, Switzerland, where his wife would join him in returning to America. This statement did little to explain the contents of his luggage though. In it was a certificate of naturalisation from the state of Wisconsin, and a list showing times of trains running from New Glarus to Philadelphia. There were also two silver watches, three chains, a flannel shirt and canvas trousers stained with blood, a pair of boots, a large knife with traces of blood, a pair of scissors, a dismantled gun, cartridges and a small amount of cash. The details from the inquest held in Wisconsin were then read to the court. Kuhn's defence, Arthur Newton, argued that regardless of the material evidence and the presence of US lawman Sheriff Estes, Johann's identity had not yet been satisfactorily proved to the court. This was agreed, and it was decided that he would remain in custody until someone from the US could be sent to England to officially identify him. Enter Peter Sangreland, an associate of Kuhn, who arrived in England on February the 6th, and confirmed that he was the Chiefs Factory worker from Wisconsin. Now charged with murder, and accompanied by Sheriff John Estes, Johann Kuhn boarded the SS Britannic, which was destined for New York. They arrived in Wisconsin on Monday, February 18th, and Kuhn was handed over to Sheriff Eaton of Dane County. It was reported in US newspapers that Kuhn feared he would be lynched by locals if he returned to Primrose. There was no danger of that happening though, as he was immediately jailed in Madison. An examination of Johann Kuhn and his crime had been set for Saturday, February 23rd, 1889. It transpired that the motivation for the murder of Wilhelm Christian was money. It said that on Thursday, December 20th, Christian had received $137 and boasted to Kuhn of his wealth. Later that evening, as the men drank together at the factory, Kuhn butchered Christian with an axe and ransacked his trunk, taking with him some personal items and a cheque for $400. Later that evening, smoke was seen rising from the factory. As it was not typical for the fires to be lit at that late hour, one Mr. Holland, who was passing by, went to investigate. Holland said that he was met by Johann Kuhn at the door, who told him that everything was in order, and sent him away. Kuhn had attempted to reduce Kristen's body to ashes, but when he realised it wasn't possible, he took his head and internal organs, placed them in a sack and threw them in the creek. He then took the cheque, forged Kristen's signature and received the money, before visiting his brother to tell him he was returning to Switzerland. This was when he hitched a ride to the train station at New Glarus, where he caught the train to Philadelphia, and boarded the Lord Goff. The last word on the case that I could find was a short paragraph in Wisconsin's Mineral Point Tribune dated January 23rd, 1890, more than a year after the crime. The short passage reads, Kuhn, who murdered Wilhelm Christen in the town of Primrose in December 1888, pleaded guilty last Thursday and was sentenced to life imprisonment at Warpun by Judge Bennett at Janesville. He left for his future home behind bars Thursday noon. It's worth mentioning that Johann Kuhn was also referred to as Hans Kuhn, Hans Cooney, and John Cooney. Much of this can be put down to translation. John, of course, is the English translation of Johann, and I've learnt that Hans was often used as a shortened version of the name, but there were far more frustrating inconsistencies concerning dates. 
For the sake of clear storytelling, I went with the most commonly reported, but British newspapers stated that the murder had taken place as early as December 12th, and according to US publications it was anywhere between the 20th and the 23rd. These dates also made me question the speed at which Kuhn had arrived in Ireland, having only left Wisconsin as little as six days before, according to US papers. But according to NorwayHeritage.com, a comprehensive database on historical shipping, the SS Lord Gough once travelled from Liverpool to Philadelphia in just eight days. However, when it comes to news, especially historic stories, inconsistencies across a variety of publications are not uncommon. American architect Frank Lloyd Wright, considered by many to be the greatest architect of all time, was born in Richland Center, Wisconsin. His best known works include the Guggenheim Museum in Manhattan, Falling Water in Pennsylvania, and his one-time home and studio Taliesin in Iowa County, Wisconsin. But these feats of architecture were to come later in life. At the age of 22, Wright built his first home in Oak Park, Chicago, a family home for himself, his wife Kitty, and what would eventually be six children. By the time he was 26 in 1893, he had his own firm and was attracting wealthy clients. In 1903, while Wright was designing a house for electrical engineer Edwin Cheney, he became infatuated with Cheney's wife, Mamer Borthwick Cheney. The two of them were often seen together in Oak Park, and soon their relationship became the talk of the village. Wright and Mamer met up in Europe in 1909, leaving their spouses and children behind. When Wright returned to the United States in 1910, he had become so unpopular in Oak Park that he returned to Wisconsin to escape the vilification and begin a new life. In the hills of Spring Green, he built a new home for himself, Mama Borthwick and her two children. The house and studio, which was named Taliesin, was a large, spacious building which also housed several employees. It was a haven for all who worked and lived there, but in 1914, tragedy struck the idyllic dwelling. On Saturday, August 15th, Frank Lloyd Wright was not home. He was 180 miles away in his office in Chicago. Mama Borthwick was at Taliesin that day with her children, 12-year-old John and 8-year-old Martha. At midday, everyone at the house had assembled for lunch. At one end of the building in a glass porch was Mama, John and Martha. Six workmen consisting of carpenters, draftsmen and a gardener were seated in the dining room at the other end of the house, separated from Mama and the children by a long, narrow corridor. Wright's butler, Julian Carlton, served lunch to everyone as he always did. He then returned to the dining room and asked one of the men if he could borrow gasoline to clean some stains out of a carpet. After Carlton was given the gasoline, he moved from room to room going completely unnoticed as he bolted all the external doors and windows. He then returned to the dining room, carrying with him the gasoline and an axe. He poured the gasoline around the door, ignited it, and then ran back down the corridor towards Mamer and the children. First he viciously attacked Miss Borthwick with the axe, delivering a fatal blow to her head. He then killed John. Young Martha made it out of the room, but by then the flames had spread. Her clothes caught fire before Carlton caught up with her and delivered several blows to her head which were fatal. Returning to the dining room and amidst the smoke and fire, he hacked to death two of Wright's employees and a son of a workman. Three others managed to escape through a broken window to call for help, but one of those men, a draftsman named David Lindblom, later died from burns and smoke inhalation. The fire almost completely consumed the residential wing of the house. Frank Lloyd Wright received a phone call in Chicago telling him that there'd been a fire at his home, but he didn't learn the true extent of the horror until he had almost arrived in Wisconsin when he got word that there had also been several brutal killings, Mamer and the children being among the victims. Julian Carlton was discovered several hours after the attack hiding in the basement of Taliesin inside an unlit furnace. He had tried unsuccessfully to kill himself by swallowing acid. His mouth and throat were so badly burnt that he couldn't speak or eat. He died of starvation seven weeks later while awaiting trial, having given no written explanation for what he'd done. Journalists and biographers of Frank Lloyd Wright have since offered theories as to why Carlton carried out the attack. 
Merrill Seacrest, a biographer, suggested that Carlton had carried out the killings because he was disgusted by the fact that Wright had abandoned his family. Another theory is that he'd been given notice to leave his position, and the third is that Carlton had been subjected to racial slurs during his time at Taliesin. Gertrude Carlton, his wife, later said that Julian had become increasingly paranoid in the weeks prior to the attack, even keeping a hatchet in a bag next to his bed. A few days after the massacre, Frank Lloyd Wright made a public declaration that the Taliesin would be rebuilt in the memory of his lover, her children and the men who had been killed. What was probably meant to be seen as a loving gesture was interpreted by many as a selfish declaration that his own legacy as an architect would not be ruined by Carlton's actions. Whatever his sentiment, he stood by his word. Taliesin was rebuilt, and still stands today, 62 years after Frank Lloyd Wright's own death in 1959. It was 2008 when police patrolmen in the city of Toma, Wisconsin, first met 49-year-old Kurt Lyburn. He claimed to have no residence and was living out of his truck. Over the next 12 months, several welfare checks were made on the wandering man, who refused any help from the police, telling them that he was okay. Eventually they accepted his chosen way of life, and determined that he didn't require any more help from the police department. Kurt Lyburn, in fact, did have a home of sorts. He would, from time to time, stay at Thomas Park Motel on Kilbourne Avenue. He'd stay for a while and pay his way, but would disappear for weeks or sometimes months on end, even leaving his truck in the parking lot while he was away. He'd struck up an agreement with the management, he could have a key to his room, and as long as it wasn't taken, he could stay there any time he wanted. For the best part of ten years, Lyburn would sporadically live in the motel, and sometimes it was later discovered without the owners even knowing he was there. Kurt Lyburn once lived with his son and daughter-in-law, but was asked to leave their home following struggles with alcohol. The last contact Kurt had with his son, Spencer, was in December of 2009. From that time on, Spencer had made several attempts to search for his father. After spotting his truck, which was full of his belongings, parked outside the Park Motel in 2011, Spencer made inquiries. He was told that Kurt hadn't been seen since December of 2009, which according to manager Sassy Truesdale, is when he last checked out. After several visits and phone calls from Spencer over the next few months, staff at the motel stopped responding. All this time, Kurt's truck remained parked outside, and was eventually handed over to the establishment as collateral for a $300 debt. In March of 2011, Kurt's sister inherited some money, some of which was intended for Kurt, so she turned to the police for help. Toma police paid a visit to the motel. By then, two years had passed since Kurt was last seen, so there was no need, they thought, to enter the old room. As far as they were concerned, the room must have already been attended to dozens of times. But the truth is, it hadn't been. It wasn't until February 3rd, 2012, that the manager of the motel entered room 19 to investigate a plumbing issue. On the bed was a badly decomposed corpse. When Toma police eventually searched the room, they found empty alcohol containers, clothing, medicine bottles, toiletries and identity papers for Kurt Lyburn. An autopsy established that he had been dead for at least two years. An exact cause of death could not be found, but it was deemed most likely to be natural causes. Identity was later confirmed by the Monroe County Medical Examiner's Office, and after viewing photos of the scene, Spencer Lyburn said he recognised the position of the body, adding that his father used to lie on his sofa the same way. Police were told that Room 19 hadn't been rented since 2009, which is when they believed Lyburn had last checked out, but he had obviously returned without anyone noticing, and for the next two and a half years, the room remained firmly closed. The reason for not renting or entering the room during that time, Sassy Teasdale said, was because of a plumbing problem and a jammed door. However, when the Wisconsin Department of Health Services commented, they said that the room had been rented as an apartment and not as a short stay, therefore the room did not require an inspection. This raises questions about whether or not the motel was still receiving payments after Lyburn's death, questions I could not find the answer to. The Park Motel in Toma was shut down and demolished, and in its place now stands Quick Trip number 718.
This picture is of Myrtle and Edward Shord, taken on their wedding day in 1903. Originally from Palmyra, Wisconsin, 17-year-old Myrtle and her 33-year-old husband moved to a farm in Whitewater, where they lived with their four children. To make extra money, the family took on students from the university, which was then known as the State Normal School, as boarders. In 1922, they took on two young men. One of them was First World War veteran Ernest Kufal. Kufal was attracted to Myrtle, something he made little or no effort to hide. Before long, the now 36-year-old housewife, married for 18 years to a man 16 years her senior, found herself in the throes of a love affair with a man 10 years her junior. The besotted Myrtle began to fantasise about a future with the young man, but her husband was in the way. So together, Ernest and Myrtle devised a plan. In the spring of 1922, Edward fell ill. When his wife became sleep-deprived from nursing him, Kufal offered to take her place one night. This is when the couple finally decided to bring their plan to a head. They slipped a lethal dose of the drug strychnine into a glass of prune juice and left it at his bedside. It's said that after drinking it, Edward Shord died an agonising death. When a coroner was called, his death was attributed to stomach flu. With Edward out of the way, Myrtle sold the house and bought a bigger property in Whitewater. She continued to house students from the university, while Ernest transferred to a different campus and then moved to Minnesota. But the two kept in touch by writing to one another regularly. When Myrtle visited Kufal in Minnesota, they talked of marriage, but he objected to living with her children, who were then aged 5, 9, 12 and 16. Rather than show him the door, the now-obsessed Myrtle hatched a plan to get rid of her children. In September of 1924, she bought some bonbons for the children, laced them with poison and arranged a road trip. Most reports say that Myrtle accompanied the children on the drive with her eldest son Ralph at the wheel. Others state that she sent the children away on their own. Either way, her instructions to them were to eat the candy once they had reached the country roads. She had hoped that during the drive, the children would suffer convulsions and Ralph would crash the car, killing them all. The plan almost worked. Ralph did crash the car after consuming the poison candy, and all the children suffered greatly from the effects, but all survived. When approached and questioned on the matter, Myrtle made up a story about buying the bonbons from a door-to-door -door saleswoman from Milwaukee. A hunt began for the mysterious Milwaukee woman, but when no clues turned up, the district attorney of Walworth County, Alfred L. Godfrey, suspected that Myrtle was directly involved. In light of this apparent attempt on her children's lives, attention turned to the death of Edward Shord, whose body was exhumed for examination. Following an autopsy, it was revealed that he had been poisoned. On September 23, 1923, under the pressure of questioning, Myrtle made no bones in confessing. She said, I gave the children the poison candy just before they were leaving for an automobile ride, in the belief that when it took effect, the machine would be hopelessly wrecked and it would appear that all had been killed in an accident. She claimed that she had carried out the deeds under the insistence of Ernest Kufal, but he was intelligent enough to leave no clear evidence of his involvement. She said that Kufal had threatened her life, telling her that if she did not do as he said, or if she told anyone of his plan, she would suffer a similar fate. Ernest admitted to their love affair, but said he had nothing to do with the poisonings and could offer no explanation for her actions. However, both Ernest and Myrtle were arrested. Myrtle was placed in Walworth County Jail in Elkhorn, while she awaited a charge of murder for the killing of her husband. This was served on November 9, 1923. Kufal was charged as an accessory. While awaiting her trial, Myrtle, it is reported, often cried for her children and said she longed to be with them. As the trial date neared, she made the bizarre statement that she would commit suicide through the power of thought. She would think herself to death, as the papers at the time wrote. According to the wardens at Elkhorn Jail, she was becoming increasingly weak, and some believed that she would not survive to see her trial. However, medical professionals believed it to be an act, and when examined, a doctor deemed that she was in good health. The trials of Shord and Kufal began in February of 1924. On February 19th, Kufal was acquitted due to lack of evidence that he was involved. According to the Bismarck Tribune, the courtroom burst into applause, while the young man's father and sisters cried tears of happiness. Myrtle's trial began on February 21st, which was her youngest son's sixth birthday. 
she pleaded guilty to what was eventually deemed first-degree manslaughter and attempted poisoning. She reportedly collapsed in the courtroom as her sentence of 20 years in the state prison was read out. She was sent to prison in Warpun, but was released after just five years. In January of 1929, she was granted a pardon on the condition that she lived with a Methodist minister in the city of Fond du Lac. She occasionally visited her youngest daughter who was now living in Union Grove. By this time her three other children were in secondary or higher education. Myrtle eventually moved to Illinois, married again and raised a second family, but even into adulthood, the family remained unaware of Myrtle's past, until the team behind the book Weird Wisconsin approached them in 2004 and showed them old newspaper clippings and records regarding her crimes. It was June the 1st, 1990, when 20 year old Christopher Scarver walked into the offices of the Wisconsin Conservation Corps training program at 539 West Fleet Street, Milwaukee. He approached the newly appointed supervisor Steve Lohman, pointed a gun at him and demanded money. After Lohman handed Scarver $15, Scarver shot him in the head. The gunman then turned to site manager John Fayen, who wrote Scarver a check for $3,000. Christopher Scarver then shot Lohman again before running out of the building. You see, Scarver had enrolled in the Conservation Corps as a trainee carpenter after being forced to move out of his mother's home due to his alcoholism. The program was, at the time, supervised by a man named Edward Petz, who saw potential in the young Scarver and had promised him a full-time position once his training was complete. But Petz was dismissed before Scarver had finished his training and was replaced by Steve Lohman. Lohman didn't see the same promise in Scarver as Petz had, and the full-time position never materialised. Scarver was quickly apprehended at his girlfriend's home, and during his trial, he reportedly claimed to be one million years old and the son of God. He was sentenced to life in prison, and sent to the Columbia Correctional Institution in Portage, Wisconsin. On the evening of April 21st, 1992, married couple Jesse and Barbara Anderson from Cedarburg, Wisconsin, went to the TGI Fridays near the Northridge Mall in northwest Milwaukee. When the night drew to a close and they returned to the quiet parking lot, Jesse stabbed Barbara 21 times about the face and head, and then stabbed himself several times in the chest. He was treated for puncture wounds to his lung, but Barbara slipped into a coma and died two days later. 34-year-old Jesse Anderson claimed that two African-American men had attacked them and showed police a Los Angeles Clippers baseball cap which he said had fallen off the head of one of the assailants. But the police became suspicious owing to the relative mildness of his wounds compared to the 21 facial stab wounds suffered by Barbara which they said wasn't typical in opportunistic attacks by strangers. Within days Jesse Anderson had made inquiries into the payment of Barbara's $250,000 life insurance policy and when details of the crime went public, a young man named Tommy Miles told police that Anderson had purchased the hat from him on the day of the attack. A woman named Aura Ronkowski, an employee of a Milwaukee military surplus store, also came forward. She said that she had sold the murder weapon, a red-handled fishing knife, to Anderson a few weeks earlier. Anderson was charged with the murder of his wife, and on August 13th, 1992, he was found guilty and sentenced to life imprisonment, with no chance of parole for 60 years. By July of 1991, Jeffrey Dahmer had taken the lives of 15 men and two 14-year-old boys over the course of 13 years. His last victim, 25-year-old Joseph Arthur Braidhoft, was murdered on July 19th. On July 21st, after spending two days laid out on Dharma's bed, his head was removed and stored in Dharma's freezer along with his torso. The next evening, with the promise of paying him $100, Dharma persuaded 32-year-old Tracy Edwards to join him at his apartment at 924 North Street, Milwaukee to pose for nude pictures. Shortly after entering the foul-smelling residence, Dharma pulled out a knife, placed a handcuff on Edwards' left wrist and led him to the bedroom. In the corner of the room, Edwards noticed what would turn out to be a 57-gallon drum of hydrochloric acid, and it was clear that this is where the smell emanated from. 
On the bed, Dharma pressed his knife against Edwards, lay across his chest, and told him he was going to eat his heart. In an attempt to appease Dharma, Edwards assured him that he was his friend and he didn't want to run away. By now, struggling to breathe due to the fumes from the acid-filled drum, Edwards requested that they move back to the living room. While Dharma sat quietly on the couch watching The Exorcist 3 on television, Edwards asked to use the bathroom. This was granted, and when he rose from his chair, he dealt a blow to Dharma's head which knocked him off balance. Seeing his opportunity, Edwards ran out of the apartment. It was 11.30pm when Edwards flagged down two Milwaukee police officers, Robert Roth and Rolf Mueller. Edwards asked if they could remove the handcuff, but when their keys failed to fit the lock, he led the officers back to apartment 213. The numerous photographs of dismembered and contorted bodies, the severed head in the refrigerator, and the three partially dissolved torsos that the officers found that night, was just a glimpse at what horrors the apartment had in store, and it was just the beginning of what is now a well-known story of depraved brutality. On the morning of November 28th, 1994, two years into his multiple life sentences, Jeffrey Dahmer, serving at the Columbia Correctional Institution in Portage, was on cleaning duty with two other prisoners in the men's shower room of the prison gymnasium. The men accompanying Dahmer that day were Jesse Anderson and Christopher Scarver. What exactly transpired in the 20 minutes they were left unsupervised for their work detail is up for debate, but it is known that Christopher Scarver pulled a 20-inch concealed steel dumbbell from his trouser leg and struck Dahmer across the head with it. He then repeatedly bashed Dahmer's face into the shower room wall before turning his attack on Anderson. Jeffrey Dahmer was left in a pool of blood, while Anderson lay unconscious from blows to the head. According to the prison officials, Dahmer was almost unrecognisable when they found him. Despite his horrific wounds, he was alive, but he died one hour later. Jesse Anderson spent two days on life support at the University of Wisconsin Hospital before he too passed away. There were a lot of theories surrounding the death of Dahmer. It was reported that the sister of Errol Lindsay, who was one of Dahmer's victims, had received numerous phone calls since 1992 from people associated with prisoners at Columbia Correctional Institute, saying that there were plenty of prisoners with no chance of parole who were willing to kill Dahmer. It was even said that Milwaukee drug dealers had orchestrated the killing, promising to pay $100,000 to the victims' families once it was carried out, and that the prison officials knew about it, and had deliberately left Scarver alone with Dahmer that day. But prison official Michael Sullivan said that Dahmer's lack of supervision at that stage was routine. He had been moved out of solitary confinement in 1993, he had more privileges, and was free to move among other inmates. He said, We did not hear rumours that Mr Dahmer was a marked man, or that there was a contract out on his life. Sullivan even stated that Dahmer wanted to die, and suggested that he deliberately put himself in harm's way. Immediately following the attack, Scarver reportedly said, God made me do it, Jesse Anderson and Jeffrey Dahmer are dead. He was adamant that the attacks were not planned in advance, but later admitted to concealing the iron bar. He also said that before killing him, he presented Dahmer with a newspaper clipping which detailed his crimes, and asked him if it was all true. This led to speculation that the killing was racially motivated, because most of Dahmer's victims had been black. Scarver further alleged that he had been revolted by Dahmer's crimes, and was angry that he was unrepentant, and sometimes joked about what he had done, on one occasion even putting a poster on the prison notice board, advertising a cannibal's anonymous meeting. Scarver was handed two more life sentences for the murders of Dahmer and Anderson. In 2005, he brought a civil rights suit against prison staff, claiming that he had suffered cruel and unjust punishment during his 16 years in solitary confinement following the killings. The suit was dismissed, and in 2006, Scarver made an unsuccessful appeal against the decision. Following years of silence, Scarver publicly stated in 2015 that he carried out the 1994 attacks after Dahmer and Anderson had poked him in the back and laughed at him when he turned around. In September of 1995, the body of Dharma was cremated, and his ashes divided between his divorced parents. His brain was preserved and held at the University of Wisconsin at the request of his mother, Joyce Flint, who hoped that, if it was studied, 
something might be found to explain her son's behaviour. Following his death and the public display of joy shown by the families of Dharma's victims, Joyce Flint said, Now is everyone happy? Now that he's bludgeoned to death, is that good enough for everyone? For many, the answer was a resounding yes. Yes.